Okay, in, from my point of view at any rate, the story begins, I know you can't read all this, but I'll just go through the key points. The story begins back in around 2000 when I stood in, yet again, <laughs> stood in for uh, uh, other people who couldn't turn up and gave a talk, which I just happened to have in my pocket, about platy choral assemblages through time. It was a group of us, like a little um, working group, who'd all seen platy choral assemblages at various points in the geological record, uh, ranging, as you can see on the left, from uh, Upper Jurassic, <coughs> to lower mid Miocene. Um, we then added from the literature late Miocene at the top, we added late Jur Triassic here from the literature, and very recently a Polish colleague here, Zapalski, has added a mid Devonian one from tabulate corals. <clears throat> so we have this long span of uh, platy coral assemblages. In another respect, the story also begins in northern Burgundy. I was on a field trip as, a, as a, in early part of my career, I won't say how long ago, when we were in Chateau Sansois and the Yon, and it's a big Oxfordian reef complex, and we were, had pointed out to us that at the base of the reef complex we had these platy corals. Sorry, there's no scale. There's a scale in the lower one, which I'm coming to in a minute. And the people leading the trip pointed out that the analogy was, was the modern reef front at Discovery Bay, um, most of which is not in a good state at all now, but here is how it was, platy corals down the reef front, and the analogy was drawn between the uh, late Jurassic and the Oxfordian in France. And then, um, just to make the point that you don't have to go to all these exotic places to see platy corals, they also occur in the Oxfordian upware in Cambridge, and you might just be able to see Cambridge here, and you might just be able to see the pen on the right. Is it on the right? Maybe I cut it out accidentally in order to crop it. Anyway, these things are about four or five centimeters or more thick and can be any extent this way. And they, in these environments, they just dominate the coral facies. We were not able to find a convincing modern analog. I know there's the reef front at uh, all sorts of places that show those what they call shingling of the plates, but we were looking for places where you could just see them as sheet reefs, if you like, um, biostromes. And we couldn't find a modern analogy at the time, but just after we published this, I found um, a description, which has since been revisited and worked on, of just such a modern environment, Pulley Ridge off Florida. You can see Florida here. Pulley Ridge is in about 60 meters of water. I never quite found out what the colors mean, but if you count up the lines, not at the time I had, <laughs> count up the little lines along here, they, they seem to be 10 meter intervals. So it's down at about 60 meters depth, and the corals are absolutely flat, as you can see from these three lovely pictures, and um, that seems to be a perfectly good modern analog. So we now have them from 200, well, from the Devonian, if you wish, right through to the present day. <clears throat> well. Uh, this facies is linked with the modern concept of mesophotic reefs. Now, this was a separate thing altogether that the reef biologists came up with, which basically meant, in their terms, almost anything that doesn't occur at the surface. There are very good reasons why they got interested in that, and I'm hoping to get through that in due course. Can you shout when it's five minutes? Because I've no idea how this is going to go. <laughs> okay, thanks. And Nadia's particular slant on all this is um, murky reefs in the origins of the coral triangle. And uh, the question is, are they reef refugia for future reefs? That, I'll come back to that, of course. So those are the three uh, main aspects of the talk. So I say, quite independently, reef ecologists discovered what they termed mesophotic coral environments. So what is mesophotic? Well, on the face of it, it means middle light. And the definition here is that she's quoted uh, with an implicit criticism. MCEs are warm water light dependent coral reef communities starting at 30 to 40 meters to the bottom of the photic zone. So notice we're fudging light with depth, which is implicitly, as I say, is being criticized. Just a few corals, she says, from that quotation, go back down to, uh, go down to 150 meters. So I make the point that here, addition to that, that note, while this definition refers to light as well as depth, the range of depths and or implicit light values cover everything from meso down to no light at all, or no, we have to say PAR, photosynthetic available radiation. In other words, what photosynthetic organisms like reef corals need to live. So we've got everything that's just in slightly deeper water right down to where the light runs out. The resulting confusion results in different kinds of reef environment being lumped together as mesophotic. I can't say, having just been in this coral reef conference, that most people who talk about mesophotic reefs are terribly aware of this fudging. 
it has to be said. Platy coral assemblages appear to be just one of the various possible examples or cases. cases. So let's look quickly at light penetration in the open ocean and in coastal waters, which are usually much more turbid. Here you can see it penetrating down to 200 metres. Let's say that's the, well, I, you can nickname that if you like, the as we did in our 2002 paper, to, the euphotic floor, or where the PAR mostly runs out for most organisms. And here it is in a more turbid environment, in a coastal environment in this case, but it doesn't have to be coastal, but that's the example. And you can see how the whole thing is telescoped right back up here to 50 metres and less in some cases, as we'll see. So, um, so it would obviously be clearer terminology to restrict mesophotic to depths where light values, however determined, are inter intermediate between surface values and the euphotic floor. <coughs> the first talk or paper I've come across that actually tries to put the photic into mesophotic was a bunch of Israeli guys, top, top people working at the Gulf of Aqaba, who did it at this very conference. And uh, we, I said to them, well, they've uh, discovered the elephant in the room because it hadn't been really investigated at all up to now. So, um, this is very complicated, and I'll try to keep it simple. On the left, depth goes, increases from left to right. So, the, this is from Fricker and Schumacher, a paper a long time ago, where they show that whatever the coral starts off with in the shallow water, it's equivalent, whatever that might mean. We don't know whether it's a ecomorph or whatever, but anyway, its nearest equivalent kind of coral can be seen to flatten as you go into deeper water. So it happens, as it were, to all corals, except for where the environment, of course, eliminates them completely. And that applies to the light-loving corals, the, the reef corals, basically, or zooxanthellates, as we call them. Down below, they show some azoxanthellates that are not, not effective because, well, they don't need the light. So over here, it's the light goes and the depth goes downward, and it's, again, a bit like that Discovery Bay slide I showed right at the beginning, you have this so-called shingling effect if it's a steep reef slope. And over here, if it's just a flat thing like Pulley Ridge, they just tend to stack up like a sort of bunch of plates um, just, you know, after a, after a big uh, dinner or something, just all stacked up all over the place in a biostrome sort of shape there. Um, from a botanical or biological point of view, you can call the, the growth plagiotropic. Uh, it's photoadaptive. Uh, in response to maximizing light capture at or near the euphotic floor. So it's a special case of uh, mesophotic reefs. <coughs> um, moving on now to the, uh, this is part of the, the big museum and elsewhere project. Several people in the audience are part of this too. I was only on the wings of it, but it's the uh, through flow project that came as one of the PIs on. And um, Nadia's work was very specifically on the corals. And I'm going to run through as quickly as I can some of the things she's saying. It's a huge collection. She's only managed to work on some of it. Not surprising. That's not a criticism. It is a vast collection. And um, she's, she says she's got uh, three tons of, well, we in the museum have three tons of coral samples. Um, something's gone wrong with this one. Some light and depth proxies for fossil coral record. In other words, trying to get at light when you, only, when you can't swim down or can't measure the light. Uh, something's missing here, but there were four examples using larger benthic forams on the left. Uh, uh, coralline algae from work, work I did with Christine Perrin and Dan Bezentz here, Perrin et al. And there were two more, which I can't obviously show you. But there are various ways of getting at depth and light using uh, proxies. <coughs> oh, here we go. They're here. Right. So this is from uh, uh, Denny Hubbard and Halleck and various people and shows again a bit like one of these steep reef fronts. And there we have the uh, stratigraphic approach, which is actually used by Francesca Bozzolini in the paper I, I started with, uh, using progradations of um, shallow, deep to shallow, deep to shallow, and so forth. And you can therefore work out from the, that sort of stratigraphy and sedimentology, which is the deeper water facies. So going on quickly to the origins of the coral triangle. There's a bit of a sidestep here, but I will mention it very quickly. Coral diversity, as you may know, is uh, very much concentrated along with that of numerous other organisms in that what's now dubbed the coral triangle, the red bit here, and the diversity here is 600 species on this diagram. And um, this is always, well, for long, I and many others have battled with trying to have theory or developing theories about why it's concentrated where it is. There's not time to go into all of that, but um, except to say that when Moira Wilson and I looked at the <coughs> 
carbonates through that, through the Cenozoic in that area. We found that there's a, a, a change in the carbonates between the early Oligocene at 30 million years and the early Miocene at 20 million. And that was due, to, as much as anything else, to the movement of Australia colliding with Southeast Asia. And at that point, uh, numerous carbonate platforms and other and reef things were, as it were, generated or made, the, the habitats were made possible for, for corals and uh, other reef building organisms. So Five it's a, minutes, thank you, Paul. That's a big jump from the point of view of people who work on the paleontology of this region, and I'm sure it's matched by other groups as well, other marine groups. So that's at least part of the story, the creation of available substrate for these sorts of organisms. Part of the, uh, the other part of the story is, or, or that's part of a bigger story here from uh, Willem Renema and others, uh, what they call the hopping hotspots. If you go back in time to, they, this is larger benthic forams, but there's plenty of evidence that the corals are following a similar pattern from late middle Miocene, uh, Eocene, beg your pardon, here. The highest diversity in the world for this particular group, there's not that high, I mean, he's talking about 16, 16 genera, I assume. Uh, species, thanks John, he's on the project so, and on the paper. Um, 16 species, we've got more even of the corals, over in the Mediterranean at that time and you can see through time, it's Mediterranean and Middle East and a little bit of India and you can see through time how that shifts to present Southeast Asia distributions. I did it uh, with Card and Wallace for Acropora and we had the same story, that's a coral I'll show you in a minute. <clears throat> so this happens over and over again if you start studying the patterns. So here's the, Nadia's study area, part of the through flow project. And um, well, this is some of the strata. I'm going to zoom through this. But the important thing is that she had platy coral fasces, or they, the project had late, in the late Oligocene at Saba. John Node um, has, uh, has the corals, and uh, Laura McGonagall worked on them. It's 100 morpho species, 55 genera, or in this platy coral environment. And I didn't pick it out, but this is, in a way, the Mahakam Delta revisited. We had the Mahakam Delta in that early paper I started with, worked by Moira Wilson, who was also on this project. And here they've revisited and numerous other localities too to get all this massive coral collection, ranging from early uh, Miocene through to late Miocene. Uh, important bit here is that the, uh, Nadia broke the faunas up into by analyzing them into three groups. Oops, sorry, wrong button. Um, here are, this is the platy coral assemblages, and uh, the time is on those two, but they're dominantly um, early Miocene and middle Miocene, and then the other two kinds of assemblage on the right. I'm zooming along. Um, in the platy coral assemblage is shown in the picture here, and a relatively small reef, but it's all dominated by platy corals. High sediment input, so it's a turbid environment by inference. So, um, lots of examples of the corals. I haven't got the time to go through them all by name. And then as you go upward, the higher light, she says here, um, and you get a much bigger reef uh, development, which she, there's a ring on here somewhere. <laughs> oh dear. Anyway, there's a figure just at the bottom here, which is dwarfed by the reef anyway. Um, so I could see it. Okay. I'll go on. Uh, they've analyzed the generic ranges, Ken, and um, uh, I've been part of that too, to, and um, Nadia, and I'm not going to dwell on this because I want to get through to the other main point. There's a lot of acropora in this, beautifully preserved, aragonitic stuff, absolutely incredible, which she's worked on with Card and Wallace. Oh, there's the figure. We've got it next time. It's up the top there in that reef. So you have changes from small reefs in the earlier part of the sequence to, uh, to the late Miocene where it's massive, more massive reefs. And I'm nearly there, yes. So, <laughs> the big question that, that is really at the bottom of all this is, and I'll finish with this, is that you all know about the, uh, the plight of coral reefs, if you want to put it that way. And the current biological thinking is that mesophotic reefs may be the savior of the situation. And that's because they are sort of, the idea of them being an ecological refuge I'm not sure I, I buy into that personally, but that's the point of studying mesophotic reefs in the fossil record. From our point of view, you see these are headings from various people's papers. 
you know, are, are they a place where corals will reseed when, when there's been coral bleaching or even major extinctions? We know from the fossil record they got through the KT extinction, for instance, uh, platy corals. So that may be a case in point. So the issue really is, is are the platy coral environments in, in the modern Southeast Asia uh, coral triangle, are they going to be the sort of place that will reseed the reefs in the future when coral reefs are even in a worse state than now, because the general projection is there will be rather muddy environments following bleaching. If you have too many successive bleachings, the reefs will turn, as Jeremy Jackson once said, just to slime. So in a slimy environment, what will recapture the, the original reef environment? And one possibility is the platy corals will hold the solution. Thank you. <laughs>